you told me you loved, you loved me too. But now I know I'm not, I'm not for you. You made me blue when I wanted you. You made me blue when I needed you. Well, if you love me, well, if you love me, well, when you told me. On you. Well, then I knew how much I needed you. You told me that I had to go, but now I know that it's not so well if you love me.
that's for sure. Yeah. Don't say why. Don't say when. Don't say anything. Just let it. I'm 
They came and took my brother away today. Yeah, the men in white coats came and picked him up. But they'll never get me. I'm normal. <laughs> I'm okay. I paint everything in my house purple. My fingernail file, my potato peeler. Hey, stay away from my frog! I make funny faces to scare the kids and save lightning bugs and Katie dids. Uh-huh. Hey, what you out there doing now? I play tiddly winks with Dracula's bat and play jump rope with a cross-eyed cat. And I play dog bill and records upside down. Keep my fish out of water so they won't drown. My brother didn't know those things. That's why I took him away. The men why I came and took him away yesterday. But I'm okay. I'm normal. <laughs> I fill my tub full of strawberry jam and feed my squirrel sugar cured ham and spread rumors about Stalin is dead and that he wore a sheepskin when he died in bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm normal. <laughs> I eat alphabet soup with a tuning fork and shine my shoes with Chinese pork. <laughs> I'm normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you show me a pig on the highway and I'll show you a roadhog. <laughs> Step on a crack, you break him on his back. <laughs> I, I throw stones at telephone poles and stick my feet in gopher holes and I throw mustaches on Playboy bunnies and start bonfires with Sunday funnies. I got a cellar full of Japanese spies and I got a red wing, a little red wagon with wings that flies. <laughs> I'm normal. <laughs> I become a werewolf after dark and I chase pigeons in the park. <laughs> And I soak my feet in cranberry sauce and I name my parakeet Betsy Ross. Ha ha ha! I'm normal. They came and took my brother away yesterday. <laughs> and it's a doggone pity. <laughs> I spread rumors that Stalin is dead and that he wore a sheepskin when he died in bed. And I eat soup with a tuna fork and I shine my shoes with a Chinese fork. <laughs> I'm normal. <laughs> yeah. Well. I paint everything on my house purple, <laughs> my fingernail files and my, my potato peelers. And hey, stay away from my fog, will you, Willie? I play Tilly Wings with Jackal's Bat, and I jump rope with a cross-eyed cat, and I play Bob Dylan records upside down, and I keep my fish out of water so they won't drown. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm normal. And I fill my tub full of strawberry jam, and I feed my squirrel sugar-cured ham. And I soak my feet in cranberry sauce, and I name my parakeet Strawberry Ross. Oh, I'm normal. <laughs> Came to my brother yesterday. Doggone pity. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm normal. <laughs>
And what year did you get started as a group? As a group, probably 1962 or 63. Uh, but that was an earlier group called, we called ourselves at that time, the Co-Cats. Did that have any meaning, that name? Well, the, the, uh, the way it started was um, Cal, Keith, and Tim, C-O-K-A-T-S. And uh, then when Dennis joined us, uh, we made the, when we had our sign with our name on it, Cal, Keith, and Tim were the three letters with Dennis on the end, uh, going the opposite way with the S being the last letter of his name. And how did you start off with what type of music were you playing at that time? We played mostly surfing music uh, to start off with, and some Beverly Brothers, probably about 70% uh, instrumental at that time. And were you getting gigs in, in uh, places in Tucson at that time, or were you just playing in the studio at home? No, we were we were getting all kinds of jobs for service station openings and those big ones, you know, <laughs> <laughs> those big gigs. Did you ever play the drive-in theaters at all, movie theaters? Um, I don't think we did play any of the movie theaters. When we first started, of course, uh, we we played every Saturday night with our dad, and that's how we really got started in the beginning. And uh, so we had. We had been before the public, as you might say, since we were small kids. And then uh, we, but we had probably at the time we started once a month or maybe uh, once in a while, twice a month, we'd play uh, places like um, there was a place in Sierra Vista called the Military Inn. And we still played once in a while up at Mount Lemmon and uh, general parties and things like that. Now, did anybody else in your family have a group? Well, we, we were still playing with our dad some and our sister. Um, started singing with a group called the Marseilles. She um, ended up recording a, a couple of sides with, with them that I wrote. And uh, later, as, um, as things sort of evolved, we uh, ended up, as one member of the Marseilles quit, we came in and, and it sort of turned into the Co-Cats, as we were called then, and then later evolved into the Lou Allen Brothers. So you, the Marseilles actually had a, a single release at that time? Yes. And uh, did and that, it sell? Yeah, I think it, um, in, in Tucson, it was number eight. So it got AM airplay then? Yes. Okay. And once you changed the name from the Co-Cats to the Llewellyn Brothers, when did that happen? About what year? And uh... Well, I can't remember the exact year, but it was probably um, 64, maybe. And... In that same year, you released a 45 by the Llewellyn Brothers, didn't you? Yes. And what one was that? Um, I think that was probably Tough He Was. Tough He Was? Mm -hmm. Did that gain you exposure uh, on, on the uh, touring circuit? Well, somewhat. I think, um, I, I don't know about on the touring circuit, but it, it did help to get us a little exposure. What were some of the uh, better known groups or acts that you did tour with back then in 1964? There was a promoter here in Tucson that uh, brought some groups in and we toured uh, through Arizona with uh, Chris Montez and Kathy Young. Then uh, a little later, the Rip Chords. Do you have any uh, memories of the tour you did with Chris Montez? Oh yeah. We had some fun times with them. They were uh, fun loving people and uh, we uh, in fact went horseback riding in Yuma. And that was one of the fun times we had uh, with the rip cords. Um, they were fun loving guys too. And, and, you know, they were uh, right on the verge of uh, really becoming big. Then they sounded a lot like the beach boys. They, their uh, hit that they had at the time was Hey Little Cobra. And uh, it was number two and they were expecting it to be number one the next week. And they got knocked out by an upcoming group at the time called the Beatles. <laughs> And the next week, uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand was number one. So while you were touring with them, this would have been probably February of 1964, I gather. Approximately, yeah. And how long did that tour last? Oh, it was probably a week. So you were backing the rip chords then? Yes. And um, did you just play within Arizona? Yes. And after you uh, toured with the Chris Montez and the rip chords, were there any other... Uh, groups that you recollect that actually made the charts in the 60s that you toured with further? 
Well, we didn't uh, exactly tour with any, but we did back some that came into town. Uh, Bobby Sherman and Donna Lauren from that uh, Shindig. Shindig, we we uh, played with them. What was Donna Lauren like? Do you remember? Well, uh, she was a sweet girl, but you know, it's um, that's been a long time, so it's a little bit hard to remember. Uh -huh. How about Bobby Sherman? He was he was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Was was he? Uh, doing a, 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 a tour himself, or was he singing duets with Donna Lauren, or what? Well, they were together when they came here, uh -huh. so I don't know if they were that way all the time, but uh, that, that that was the only time we knew of them, you know, so we we played for one and then the other. As I remember, though, they they didn't sing together, I don't think. I think they, no. sang, they sang single, they weren't singing together. Where were you playing these shows at? Uh, the ones where we toured, it was different places in the different cities. Uh, I know in, I remember in uh, Safford, it was at the Armory. Uh, I can't remember. There was a big building in Yuma that I remember, and I don't remember what, what kind of a place it was. But uh, in Tucson, uh, there was a place here that uh, was kind of popular for dances then. Um, it used to be an ice skating rink. You remember the name of it, King? It was Iceland. Iceland <coughs> Bowl. Iceland, Iceland Bowl. Bowl, yeah. And uh, a lot of them were there. We, we played... Um, as openers for uh, the Turtles there, and uh, then um, Swing and Medallions were there. Yeah, Swing and Medallions, uh, uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Is that right? Yeah. And then at the uh, Randolph Park, we opened for uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders. We then also opened for the Yardbirds. And the Yardbirds, yeah. Did you hang out with the Yardbirds? No. Do you remember if it was Jimmy Page or Jeff Beck who was in the group at the time? Did you oh, I, I, I don't, don't remember. Really know. Later, uh, uh, there was uh, we had a chance to play with uh, Chuck Berry. We backed Chuck, Chuck Berry one night, and that was that was great fun. Did uh, he say anything to you that stands out in your mind now? Well, <laughs> we we opened with uh, our our drummer Tim was uh, hunting again. <laughs> yeah, he's a hunter, and uh, he's out hunting today, right? Yeah, <laughs> and and at that time he was hunting when we somebody called us and it was like hey, we're going to do this tonight. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'll bring a drummer. And we opened with the other drummer. The uh, Chuck Berry was not impressed. And uh, later, uh, Tim got home to come in for the second show. And when we changed to Tim, Chuck Berry came alive and said he was the backbone of the band. So <laughs> that was one thing that I remember. Now, what was it like to be uh, playing around Tucson in uh, the mid '60s, because you were one of the more popular bands. Uh, what were some of the other bands, and what was going on in, in Tucson at that time? What were the hot spots and places you were playing at? Well, there was a one place, of course, was the Teenage uh, High Hole Club, and um, there were uh, a lot of, uh, of bands, a lot, a lot of live bands then, and uh, a lot of competition. Uh, Dearly Beloved uh, was one. Before that, they were called the Intruders. The uh, Five of Us. Do you remember any more of them, Keith? Bow Street Runners. The Groads. We'll probably leave somebody out. And, and we'll leave a bunch out. But yeah, there were, there, yeah there is, that's a long time ago. The Chevelles. Time. Yeah, the Chevelles was one. And there were a lot of places to play because not only were there nightclubs, but there were parties. And parties sure. did not have records they had a band that's yeah. all there was to it yeah and the fraternities and sororities we played a lot so there was a lot of action so in some of the other bands you had mentioned like the dearly beloved the groads uh who in tucson at the time was the one that was considered the number one band that everybody was trying to compete with or be bigger than i'd say probably the dearly beloved was number one you know then between us and the lou allen brothers and the five of us and the groads we were all pretty popular also but, you know, that's anybody's call. When you were on the uh, radio, because you did get some airplay, what were some of the uh, local stations that they were playing your 45s on then? I think uh, KIKX was one. Uh, of course, I think when my sister's record was popular, it was KTKT. And both of those stations are no longer around as uh, music stations, is that right? That's right. Now, um, you also had mentioned previously that uh, by 1967, actually 1968, you got a chance to go out to Los Angeles to play on a TV show. Uh, what was it, and how did that get about? Well, that was that was in 1968 because it was called Happening 68. It was um, 
it was put on by uh, Dick Clark and uh, Paul Rivera and the Raiders were the hosts, sort of. They uh, they were running a contest here in Tucson, um, and they had it at the sound studio at Old Tucson. And they said that um, whoever won this contest would uh, be on a national TV show. And, you know, at, at that time, there were a lot of contests, and uh, a lot of the time it was uh, just so somebody could get some free music and give the bands a chance to compete, you know. Sure. And uh, But we thought, well, if they say it's going to be a national TV show, they have to do it if they say they're going to. So we decided we were going to do it. And we went into it with the idea of winning. And uh, they had, I don't even know who the judges were, but you had 10 minutes to play. So we decided in order to to do anything at all to show your versatility, 10 minutes was not enough. So we did a medley of uh, probably nine or 10 songs in that 10 minutes. And uh, we noticed at the end, the judges were looking at their watches because it went right up to about nine minutes and 35 seconds. We had it down. Do you remember what we did? Oh, well, I, can, I know we did Walk Like a Man, and I think we did some Righteous Brothers, and um, the, some Buckinghams. Yeah. Did you do any original? Yeah, not not for not in that. But uh, then when we were on that, we got from that, we went to that Happening 68, and we did an original there. But that was only a dream, wasn't it? Yes. What were the other bands that you were competing against, do you remember? The only one I can remember was the one that won. And they were called Bluesberry Jam. But you mean on on television or? Oh, here? you mean on Happening '68? Yeah. I was thinking before oh, you. Oh, here in Tucson. Yeah. I can't remember. I can't remember either who all was there. But now you had mentioned Bluesberry Jam had won the on, uh, uh, on Happening '68. Well, what actually? What was well, the Happening '68? Yeah, it, that was. Um, it turned out to be a sort of a contest thing too, and we were on Happening three times. We won the first two times, and we lost the third time to this band called Bluesberry Jam from Los Angeles. So did you have to go out to Los Angeles each week to, to film these? Well, we went twice. They taped three or four shows at a time, so we were on one show. Uh, we, t we taped two of the shows that we were going to be on, but they were not, like, in succession. You know, they'd have, like, four weeks at a time, and I think we were on, like, maybe the first and third or something like that. But when we were there, it was... Um, it was amazing, you know, to us because it was really big time. It was in the ABC studios and these big cameras floating around in the air and and the, everything was so loud and, and it seemed like everybody that was anybody was there. James Brown, uh, Sunshine Company. Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy Leonard, was, was he singing? <laughs> yeah, he had some song. I think it might have been Gentle on My Mind that he was singing. <laughs> and Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell was Joey Bishop. Well, no, that was before Gentle on My Mind because Glenn Campbell hadn't done that yet. No, that's 68. Make... Was it? Yeah. yeah but yeah, Glenn well, Campbell was doing by the time I get to Phoenix. He was just... Getting rolling. Huh? Uh -huh. Joy Bishop and Regis Philbin were both there. And Brenton Wood. Yeah. Did you get to talk to them? or? Yeah. Some of them. Mm -hmm. well, who would you... Um, one I remember in particular, too, Brenton Wood and Regis Philbin. Regis Philbin was really, really a nice guy. He talked to us out in the parking lot for about an hour. Just, you know, real, just shooting the bat, that's all. What about uh, Brenton Wood? Now, he's the one who did uh, Give Me a Little Sign, Boogum Boogum Soul. Yeah. Um, he was nice also. He, he didn't spend as much time with us and didn't really wasn't really concerned with what we were doing there or, or where we were going, you know. But right. Regis Philbin actually acted like he was concerned about you know, helping us out if he could, you know. What was he doing on the show at the time? Uh, and he, uh, he was a judge. Oh, was he a judge? Uh, yeah, he was a judge. No he talked uh, to us. In fact, uh, he voted for us on the time we lost. Uh, but uh, Regis Philbin and Lalo Schifrin, and I don't know if you know who Lalo uh, Schifrin, he was, uh, he wrote the uh, Mission Impossible theme and uh, some of the stuff like that. And uh, he voted for us, so we felt like that was a pretty good vote, <laughs> even though we did lose by one. The one we lost was to the, the judge was Batwoman. I don't remember her Yvonne real name. Craig? Yeah. Yes. Was it Yvonne Craig? Uh, she got uh, coerced by. Uh, uh, what do you remember the Freddie Cannon? Was well, Freddie Cannon was one of them, but it was. Um, he was one of them too. Fabian. Fabian was the one that talked uh, Batwoman onto his side. But you know, uh, it, this is uh, something that that I'll always feel had something to do with it. When we came, they told us to go in this room and wait. And so pretty soon then the second band came into wait, and that was called uh, the Postman, is that what they did? Oh, I can't remember. And uh, and we thought they were a pretty good band. We were afraid we'd lose to them. Well, we weren't really worried about Bluesberry Jam, but we, but they never came in the room, and when we came out, they were over in the corner talking to Fabian. <laughs> so I don't know. That's I always felt like that might have a little bit to do with the vote, but they were from L.A. and, and yeah. uh, 
Well, when you came back, uh, you came back three times, you had mentioned. Did you get a chance to meet with the uh, Paul Revere, Mark Lindsay, or the Raiders much? We talked to them quite a bit. Yeah. Which, which one? Which Raider? Um, well, Paul Revere and Mark Lindsay. And then, you know, I don't remember the, uh, the other members' names, but I know um, the drummer talked to us quite a bit, and he showed uh, our drummer how to, uh, how to look like you're playing the drums. Right. And, you know, because when you do those shows, I guess it's still the same. They're, they're not live usually. Right. And um, so when you hit a cymbal, it has to look like you really hit the cymbal has to rock. And he showed him how to roll and hit the cymbal with his knuckles. And, uh, and you pantomime or lip sync to the, to the song. Oh, I see. So you weren't doing those songs live on no, the show. You were no, lip-synced. they played. They played. Uh, we did a recording of it, and they did the recording, and we lip synced. And what was the recording different than the actual record version that you put out on Only a Dream that you did on the show? Only that it might have been a little shorter. Uh, might have been cut short. I, I don't. I, but it was the same. So when you were, uh, you said you had spoken with uh, Revere and Mark Lindsay. Does anything stand out in your mind about Mark Lindsay or Paul Revere? Uh, not that I can remember. No, they, you know, most of the people that we met there seemed to be real down to earth and, and nice people. Did they pay you all your expenses to get out there and everything? I don't know that they paid our expenses. I know they paid the hotel room. Did you go out on uh, the Sunset Strip when you were there and see what was happening? Oh, uh, yeah. What was it like, this being 1968? Well, being from Tucson, it was uh, it was something else for us. It seemed like the the whole street was just full of people, you know, at, at night like that, and going to all the different clubs there, and there was a lot of activity. Do you remember any of the clubs you went to, or any of the bands you might have seen? Well, I remember one club. Do you remember any of them, Keith? Um, well, they wouldn't let me in, so I don't remember very many of them. <laughs> uh, and I don't I don't remember. Uh, I was too young. Yeah, Keith was pretty young then, but the the only one that I can really remember the name of, and I don't know why I remember this, but it was Pandora's Box. Okay. Did you did you see any bands in there? Yeah, but I don't remember who. You know, that's a lot of years ago. <laughs> Do you remember anything about being in there that sticks out in your mind? Well, just real crowded. Yeah, it was. I mean, there was a lot of people there in in Hollywood. Now, after uh, happening '68, that uh, only a dream '45 uh, was your last commercial release, wasn't it? Yeah. So after you did the show and uh, you lost the Bluesberry Jam, what did, what did the band do after that? Well, we um, we still played a lot. Uh, well, a year after that, we went on the road and we traveled. Uh, we started in Oregon, Portland, and then down to uh, Salt Lake City and then back through the Midwest. And you were on a tour with other bands? No, um, we, we um, went through a booking agency in... Uh, Hollywood, Johnny Robinson Agency, it was called. Yeah. And then he uh, later uh, hooked up with another agency in the Midwest. There were other bands that were booked by these people, but it was uh, we weren't traveling with anybody or anything like that. So where were you playing? Uh, in nightclubs. Uh, by then, Keith was 21, right. and Tim looked 21. <laughs> Tim had a fake ID, so, uh, but they never asked him for his ID. Keith didn't have a fake ID, but they always asked him because he looked so young. So we were able to play in the clubs with, with him being almost of age, but not quite. When we traveled in the Midwest, we uh, went through the Gary Van Zeeland agency. Did you meet up with any other bands, uh, hang out with anybody at that time? Yeah, uh, there was one band that, that really impressed us, uh, the Jules Blattner Trio in the Midwest. They were fantastic. The drummer for their band did a drum solo that I've never seen an equivalent of. He, um, he moved around the whole stage beating on things and, and when he was on the drums he would throw his drumsticks into the air so high that uh, in, an, in an auditorium or something like that he'd throw them to where they almost hit the ceiling and he never missed them when they came down. I never missed the beat. He was fabulous. Two bass drums and did uh, he could do uh, uh, I, I'm, I don't know exactly what the terms are, but I guess on the drums it's like 16th beats on each foot and things like that. This was 1969, this tour, this uh, not tour, but the gigs you were playing uh, in Oregon and the Midwest. You came back and uh, the 60s were about over at that time. The hippies things were still mm-hmm. going, but I guess the optimism wasn't there. Uh, did that ever affect you, any of these things that were going on at the time, the uh, radicals and the uh, 
counterculture? It didn't affect us. Uh, when we were in Madison, Wisconsin, we did drive down by the uh, Capitol when the, when they were marching on the Capitol and had uh, the uh, National Guard out with their shields and everything. So we got to see some of that stuff, but it didn't really affect us. So you never, you, your band never got into any politics. It was just mainly uh, a good time band. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been, you've been uh, playing music as the Llewellyn Brothers since the 60s and up till the present day, isn't that right? Yeah. And was there ever a time where you just stopped playing as a band for a long period of time? We quit playing for almost 10 years when Bobby died. That would be when? 1981. To 1991, then? Mm -hmm. Approximately. Right. What were you doing during that time? Well, of course, uh, Keith and Tim and Bobby and I are all, we're all in uh, in our dad's plumbing business, too, so we were, we were just mainly doing plumbing. What provoked you to get the band back together and start playing again? Well, I think, you know, it's something that gets in your blood, and that was a long time to be off. My brother Tim and myself had both gone through divorces. <laughs> we're kind of feeling free again, you know. And I called a friend that had the hop on 22nd Street and asked him if we got back together, if he'd have us play there. And he said, anytime you're ready. So having, you know, a place to go and the incentive to do it, we went ahead and started practicing. And we practiced for probably two weeks and then started playing at the hop on Thursday nights. And you've never stopped playing together as a band since 1991 then, right? Right. And uh, where are you playing now mainly, and what areas? We play almost strictly for private parties. We're busy from October through January. Then it's very slow in the summer months, except for maybe some weddings and reunions. We're naturally big on reunions because we went to high school here, so a lot of the gigs that we played for back in those days were high school proms and, and graduations and stuff, and they remember us, so they want us for their reunion. So that's a big plus for us. What what what's your repertoire now? What 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 songs or what uh, music are you playing? We play the same music that we did, that we learned through the years from 1966 till the time we quit in 1981. A lot of that we well retained. before 1966. Yeah, but most a lot of that we forgot. That, that's pretty old stuff, surfing music and that kind of stuff. But once we got into the vocals, a lot of that we've retained that we learned from 66, the British invasion and all the soul music and stuff like that, up till we quit in 81. And then after we started in 91, we added a lot of country western to it since it was becoming real popular and, or was real popular at the time. And uh, almost a requirement to have in your repertoire for nightclubs. We do a lot of the modern country now, but we still do. Uh, all of our oldies but goodies, and it's it makes a real good mix. Do you play any of the original ones that you did back then? Any of the original songs? Our originals? Yes. Seldom. What ones have you played? Well, I think um, It Must Be Love is probably one of the ones that we... Yeah, we still play that sometimes. And I think I'm glad maybe once in a month, but, you know, we were always a kind of a, as you say, a cover band, and that's the kind of stuff that we do the most.